everyone welcome back to my channel today I'm gonna talk to you about the electrolyte disturbances of DKA and I'm gonna give you a method to keep these straight so you never get those questions wrong again so so here's a typical question about DKA a 20 year old woman comes to the ER with abdominal pain and nausea she had polyuria and excessive thirst for one day Physical exam shows tachycardia and dry mucous membranes. She's obviously dehydrated. A lab results show sodium chloride. Bicarb is very low. Glucose is crazy high. Uh, she has hyperglycemia and a high anion gap acidosis consistent with DKA. Now, to answer this question about what potassium findings you would most likely see. You really need to know that most of the body's potassium lies inside the cell. It's 150 versus 4, meaning that if you really want to deplete total body potassium, you'd remove it from inside of the cell. And that's exactly what DKA does. So the key thing about DKA is that there is no insulin. This is really the big problem here. Because there is no insulin, glucose cannot go inside the cell. It stays outside. And at the same time, cells are starved for energy. Now, they can't get glucose as an energy source. They need another alternative. And the liver provides that alternative, which is the ketone bodies. These are keto acids, and so they're going to cause a high anion gap metabolic acidosis because these are excess unmeasured anions. Now, what does metabolic acidosis do? When you have a lot of hydrogen outside because of the acidosis, this is obviously going to drive hydrogen inside the cell in exchange for potassium. So more intracellular potassium is going to move outside the cell. And this is really what's causing the increased extracellular fluid potassium. That's to keep a cation balance that happens. All right. So this is the first consequence. The second is remember that the equation for osmolarity includes glucose even though most of the osmolality is dependent on sodium because it's two times however when glucose goes crazy crazy high obviously that is gonna increase serum osmolality all right so the consequence of increased ECF glucose is increased osmolality now because we have a lot of osmotic pressure outside the cell, it's going to drive fluid to shift outside into the intravascular compartment. All right? It's going to absorb fluid into the vessels. At the same time, it's going to absorb fluid from the interstitium of the kidney into the kidney tubules. And that's going to lead to diuresis and the polyuria that these patients experience and as a result of this diuresis you lose a lot of your electrolytes you lose volume that's number one so she becomes dehydrated she becomes thirsty right at the same time there's not enough time to reabsorb sodium and so total serum sodium is gonna go down that's one uh, at the same time there's not also a chance to absorb to reabsorb potassium in the kidneys so there's decreased total potassium now because this increased osmolarity drives fluid outside the cells this is going to dilute the serum sodium concentration leading to dilutional hyponatremia and this would contribute to the low serum sodium concentration at the same time because fluid is shifting out of cells it's gonna and most potassium lies inside the cell it's gonna lead to hyperkalemia that's along with the metabolic acidosis we just discussed plus nothing is there to push potassium back into the cell because there is no insulin we know that insulin pushes potassium inside the cell so all these contribute to the hyperkalemia 
And so now you know that this 20 year old woman has increased extracellular potassium with decreased intracellular potassium stores that are being depleted as fluid shifts outside cells and as it's lost in urine. So the major electrolyte disturbances you need to know about DKA is number one because this is an anion gap metabolic acidosis. It's consuming the buffer system of the body which is the bicarb and so the bicarb will be low. It's consumed by all these keto acids. As the body tries to buffer them, it consumes the bicarb. At the same time, the serum sodium concentration is low because of dilutional hyponatremia, because glucose drives water into the, the vessel. And if you remember, the equation for serum sodium concentration represents total body sodium over total body water. So if you have a lot of water, you have low serum sodium concentration. And obviously you know why there is a high serum potassium and there's a high osmolality because there's a lot of glucose, a lot, lot, lot of glucose. So based on this, can you solve this question? A patient has an increased anion gap metabolic acidosis. He didn't tell you what it is exactly. There are many causes of high anion gap metabolic acidosis, an appropriate treatment is instituted. Repeat lab studies reveal an increase in serum bicarbonate and sodium, a decrease in serum osmolality, and a drop in serum potassium. Now for a treatment to cause this, there must have been a problem in those same parameters, all right? The treatment is reversing the disturbance. So it's reversing all this that we have seen in the previous slide. It's the complete opposite of what's going on here, right? So we need to bring this back to normal. We need to bring the serum bicarbonate back to normal, and that will be by stopping ketone bodies from being produced. And the only way you can do this is to give insulin. So that's okay. Now, how do you reverse serum sodium? Just give something to wash out the glucose, and that will therefore um, return serum sodium back to normal because if you wash out a lot of water, there is no dilution anymore, right? It's dilutional hyponatremia, right? Uh, serum potassium, you can also reverse that by giving insulin. It's going to dry potassium inside cells, right? Uh, how, so it's going to decrease extra cell flow of potassium. However, you still need to give potassium because remember, the total body potassium is depleted. Remember that. And osmolality, if you give insulin, it's going to drive glucose inside cells. And so it's no more uh, contributing to uh, osmolality much. And so it's going to decrease osmolality. So the only treatment that can do this is insulin and normal saline. Now, you might ask me, mineralocorticoids, for example, can decrease serum potassium. However, mineralocorticoids would increase sodium reabsorption, and so they will actually increase rather than decrease serum osmolality, so that's irrelevant. Loop diuretics would decrease serum potassium, that's true. Um, however, they are not usually used for treatment of any cause of high anion gap acidosis. Just think about the causes and think about what treatment for any of these causes would be needed to reverse this. For a treatment to cause these effects, there must have been a problem in these same parameters produced by this high, high anion gap acidosis. The only type of high anion gap acidosis that leads to disturbances in these parameters that would require reversal is DKA. All right, I hope this is helpful and thanks everyone for watching. Stay safe and be strong.